to a certain extent, it's genetic. I think so. Yeah. I think, interestingly, because you mentioned something about peptides, and I love reading Dr. Candice Pert's work on molecules of emotions mm -hmm. and uh, the neuropeptide expert. So I think, yes, genetics, the predisposition of anything, right? And I think that was a predisposition. My sister was very psychic every so often, but they were afraid of it. Welcome to Old God Talks to Me, a podcast dedicated to helping guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. Ladies, if you want to know what your guy is thinking, this podcast is for women too. Each week, a special guest helps you create that life you've imagined. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships and hot sex. Yeah, you hear me, getting laid more frequently other guy vices, and topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review this podcast. And be sure to go to www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and grab a free copy of our new digital magazine. The Standard Academy, where we talk about erogenous zones, growing hair back, and other things that will help you create that kick-ass life. Now get ready to listen up and share with friends. This is Orsi Official Old Guy at OldGuyTalksToMe.com, a podcast dedicated, well, to helping older guys and those they love to create a kick-ass life for themselves. Yeah, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's just, sometimes you got to get in off the beaten path. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, science, functional medicine, stem cells, peptides, PRP, uh, all sorts of relationships, sex, cigars, things like that. But now we're going to take a whole, <laughs> we're going to take a whole different turn here. And uh, this is the first time I've ever had somebody in this space. And I have with me Nancy Orlin Weber. And she is a bona fide, I'm going to say bona fide, psychic detective, because I'm sure she, and we're going to talk about the, some people probably think that if you're a charlatan or have said so, I'm sure you've not more than once. And she's had many hats. She started work as an RN after her, her, after her first husband attempted to murder her when she was five months pregnant. Okay, that's, that's an interesting start to, to a relationship. Um, Nancy left nursing in 1973, reaching a crossroads. After great success as head nurse in an experimental acute psychiatric unit in the South Bronx, she was offered the top research position in NYS psychiatry. Instead of being a permanent disability from the attempt of her life, she left nursing. She has a private practice as a medical, intuitive, animal communicator, medium, and psychic. Her studies include homopathy, nutrition, chemistry, herbology, applied kinesiology, and frequency. She has also worked with Gestalt Primal Therapy, Marino Institute, and Psychodrama and Crisis Intervention. In 1979, she began a 40-year-plus career of working as a consultant with law enforcement agencies as a psychic detective. She received an honorary Chief of Detectives badge from a sheriff's recommendation for her work. She's the author of The Life of a Psychic Detective, featured criminal cases brought to resolution with her assistance. The techniques she used are explained and amplified in the book. All Nature Speaks. Conversations with Pets and Wildlife is also available. In 2004, the first documentary in her work as part of a team in law enforcement was created by Court TV. That was the first of many documentaries that are now shown throughout the world at Nancy, and you can find them at nancyorlandweber.com and on YouTube. And there are many podcast interviews also there. And I'll have all the links uh, in the show notes so you don't have to worry about, about mentioning Toss them out there, but they'll all be there for you to find, including some uh, to Nancy's website and also some of the other things that she's doing that are a little different these days. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Nancy, welcome. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ores. I have to tell you, when I saw your name, I have a very dear friend about 20 years at least. And in fact, I helped perform his wedding with his wife, who was a good friend of mine, Dr. O. And his name is Dr. Arrest also. Okay. I would call him Dr. O. So you're Dr. Arrest. Okay. Or you're the Arrest O, whatever you like. Whatever, whatever. I get called a lot whatever. of names. Yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm used to being called lots of things. Uh, sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. Uh, so no. it's, it, it's, it's okay. Um, so uh, I start this off, I usually start this off with most of my guests when I remember. Um, what's the most important thing you've done today? Keep in touch with my family in Florida. Okay. All right. Yeah. So absolutely number one. Yeah. So at the time that we're recording this, there's a uh, Hurricane Ian is coming through, and uh, right. and so so uh, uh, kind of a tense situation, and it seems to be, uh, you know, hopefully people are doing well and uh, are in safe places, and the carnage will not be too bad. Uh, so Nancy, psychic detective, and when did you first realize you had these powers? Oh, I didn't. You know, when we're born, I don't know when you start wearing glasses uh -huh. or I did, but there are children at two that wear glasses, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't necessarily know that that's any different, their eyesight, until you find out. I didn't know that how I knew things that were secrets for others from the time that I can recall at about age two and was yelled at for it because nobody else knew and I was telling the secrets. And how did I know? So I didn't call it that and I didn't know that it was so different other than uh, it wasn't lovingly accepted. Mm -hmm. So I didn't understand that even when I got into nursing. I thought people went into the medical field, the nursing, because they loved anatomy, physiology, chemistry, supporting others, relieving suffering and seeing what was wrong. And I can recall I was 19 and the patient came with congestive heart failure and I was the head nurse in a unit early on. And the doctor had ordered uh, studies for congestive heart failure. And I said, why are you doing that? And the patient had just been admitted on a stretcher and I glanced and I said, don't, don't do that, do an upper GI. He said, why? I said, you'll see. He's got a large hiatal hernia. He doesn't have congestive heart failure. He said, how do you know? And I never forgot what I answered him. I can't believe I did this. This is not my mouth now and hasn't been. I looked at him and I said, don't you see it? So he did order an upper GI. He came back and said, how did you get that? I said, I don't know, but I do. And I thought to myself, doesn't everybody do that? Because I didn't know the difference. Until then, that moment I thank him for, because it made me aware that whatever that was that would blurt out who's dead, who's dying, who's alive, why they are, uh, a baby in a belly that nobody else knew about. I mean, all kinds of things would happen. I never knew that that was unusual. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that, uh, I want to go back a, a little bit. Sure. You, you mentioned that uh, this was not well accepted was that was that tell me a little bit more about that uh we lived in brooklyn and i hear, heard the story years later why so my great my grandmother and grandfather step grandfather lived in laconia new hampshire and they never went out at night and it was country country and my mother woke up in the middle of the night about 2 a.m and she called up there they didn't have a phone so she called an aunt up there and said they just went over the cliff on route something. And my aunt said, what are you doing? Go back to sleep. She said, no, no, I just saw it in my mind. And so they saved her life, my grandmother and my step-grandfather, mm -hmm. by that dream. My mother hated it. Now, don't ask me, because she loved her mother. I have no clue. But she hated the abilities, big time. She mm -hmm. would backpedal so fast that she exiled me for years. She was terrified of me opening my mouth, totally. Sure. Okay. So that was non-acceptance, but it wasn't non-acceptance inside me. Okay. So th this is this is to a certain extent that it's genetic. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think interestingly, because you mentioned something about peptides, and I love reading Dr. Candace Pert's work on molecules of emotions mm -hmm. and uh, the neuropeptide expert. So I think, yes, genetics, the predisposition of anything, right? And I think that was a predisposition. My sister was very psychic every so often, but they were afraid of it. 
do you understand how this particular gift power and uh, works? I would love to put in the room, which I have before. I have had conversations with physicists, conversations with all kinds of science because I love understanding and I don't understand. There's no way I think we ever put together everything other than to say, for me, uh, if our bodies are capable of knowing when to close the pores because it's cold out and heat up the inside deeper, maybe we have other things that that life force, that knowledge, that core knowledge that we don't even know. We still don't answer. Why does labor and delivery start? What prompts it? Right? So the psychic world to me is the root of the word is soul. It's Greek. It means soul. So I think it's the essence of the energy that lies within everybody. For instance, clairvoyance, we have pineal glands. We now know it has optical receptors and we know it has other things like our eyes. The East always said it was a third eye, literally, not just figuratively, literally. Well, I had a photographic memory when I was a kid. I would snapshot and I knew that in my mind, I would see exactly. So I never studied for tests. I just looked at my notes in my mind. Oh, and went, oh, oh, okay. I, I hate you already. I hate you already. I'm a dyslexic. And, and, and when I was in school, somebody, somebody, would <laughs> somebody would study for 30 minutes. And I'd be there grunting it out to get my C at, at three hours later. I understand, but I lost <laughs> it. I'm not young anymore. Uh, yeah. I don't have that photographic memory. Oh, you're not, you're, you're I have not, whatever's left of me. <laughs> you're, not in a, you're not in grade school anymore when that was really important. No, um, but it was. So, so do you, do you see, I, I know you see in, in, into the past. Do you see into the future? And I, I, I don't want to go back because I, 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 I might forget this. Um, so I, I, I mentioned before we got on camera uh, that I interviewed a polymath. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about, we, I mentioned that I was going to have a psychic detective on the show. And he was talking about the the fact that that this that your power may be in different dimensions of the universe, and, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what he was in, in things that we don't necessarily understand. But he he he, he referred to it as as dimensions, uh, and and that the the one that 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 you're kind of transposing a little bit differently is time, and so and and so my question to you is, uh, and this and this kind of leads into my question. Do you see into the future or only the past? Mm -mm. I see into the future. I believe, as Orson Welles had said, Nostradamus, it is the patterns that are being created. And we can, I think it's a calculation internally. Mm -hmm. So I, to give you a funny story on that, I lived in Las Vegas for a few months when I was 21. I would sit by the roulette wheel. I wasn't, I didn't have a lot of money. I would take $20 with me. And I was a very careful non-gambler. I didn't like throwing my money away. I was a nurse on sabbatical for six months after a surgery. Anyhow. It's funny because I, I live in Las Vegas. So. <laughs> my whole family lived there. My niece was a senator from Nevada living in Vegas. My nephew ran a casino. So and there I am. I'm always at the head of the roulette wheel while they were playing. I won every single night. They would change dealers on me. They would do whatever. I could see and calculate without thinking. There was no thought, mm -hmm. but I can feel the velocity of the flick of the hand of the dealer. They would change them. I just wait a few and then go again. The flick of the ball, the velocity, the spinning wheel. And suddenly I would know numbers, put them on and I would win nine out of 10. Mm -hmm. So I would go home every night with about $75 because I was careful. I didn't want to bet big. I was afraid to do that. I was not somebody who ever thought money was for me mm -hmm. <laughs> or entitled. So uh, that to me is what you're referring to. Somehow I can calculate patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, and because, But I think it's a blend. You know, the polymath might be able to figure out some of it too. Because there is a blend of picking up the patterns of others from life experience, from body language, this, just knowing psychology of behavior. I worked and ran an acute south uh, a unit in, in psych 
We made history there. In 10 days, I can break pretty much any psychotic. Me, catatonic, 20 years, talk to me in 15 minutes. Why? So I think it's the calculations. I mean, I'm using a term I don't normally use for everybody because they look at me. And the group who loves the psychic stuff, um, sometimes it's hard for them to understand that the reason I don't do predictions on personal levels, I've done them on world levels. I've done them on football games years ago. I hated, I didn't want to do it. They would say, oh, come on, you know, you live in that town. Tell us who's winning. <laughs> I say, okay, I don't, you got to tell me who's playing. I don't watch. And I'd be right. And I'd win, <laughs> I'd win the pool. Oh, good. But that's, that's um, I think you're picking up information all the time. You don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And so it's a calculation. It's a blend of everything. Sure. Do you need accountability? Are you looking to change the course of your life but have failed to keep on track? Too often we take in information and fail to act. Do you need an accountability program to stay the course? Then go to www.thestandard.academy and find out about my accountability program that goes with my course that helps you find out what you want, why you want it, and how to get it. The accountability program keeps you on track to get results. So you started working with the police. When was that? Oh, no, I, actually, I want, I want, I want to, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back because I know we're going to get into this and this, we're going to spend a lot of time in this place. Okay, you're pregnant five months mm. and your husband attempts to kill you. Mm -hmm. What, what? is I, I guess the only way the only way i can say is like what's that all about that's so weird well <laughs> he was on a split brain research study in a laboratory he was one of two uh, eight people out of i think two thousand who won a fellowship and it was the laboratory was in puerto rico it was with one of dr roger sperry's uh, associates dr ron Meyerson. and so i went to the lab with him also because I was fascinated, but it was all neurophysiology. And mm -hmm. I've always been in love with that. So I would be listening and listening. And we were married not very long, uh, just a few months. And uh, he became violent. And years, it, he was bipolar. We didn't know it. I didn't know it. His history was kept a secret from me, from his, by his family. They knew. They didn't care because he was just brilliant and they just loved him, except for his sister. He had opened up her head when he was six. She was six and he was 10, I think. Eh, I didn't find any of that out. I was naive. I was 25. And the funny part is I am psychic. I was psychic, but not about him. Hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, but I always think that there is a purpose to everything. If you can make a purpose of it. You know, I don't know that everything is planned or destiny or anything. I don't know. But I do know once things happen, it's what I do about them. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. what I, and the fun thing I discovered, I mean, people who hear this and they go, fun. He was strangling me. He had already thrown me. And now he's strangling. And I know I probably will pass out shortly. So I'll go limp as if I'm dead. And I was able to go limp. And he let go because he thought he killed me. And I was very careful to protect the belly, right? And I waited about 10 minutes and it was an open concept place. We lived in old San Juan. And I walked over to him and I was a different person. For the first time in my life, I was totally me. I had always been very careful to be very appropriate and not scare people with my abilities and be very nice, and I was a goody two-shoes. I excelled in school. I loved homework, and they hated me. <laughs> My mm -hmm. friends yeah, with hated your photographic it. memory, yeah, I would too. Oh, they hated it. So, you know, I was always very careful not to divulge too much of who I was. And we had other things going on in the background that made it trauma, but it didn't matter. I walked over to him, and I looked at him, and I never would forget. I looked at his face. He was in shock, and I said, I would suggest you never sleep again. There will be a knife in your heart. You ever touch me again. And I walked away just like that. I was like, whoa, who is that? Where did that come from in me? 
But that really started a road that taught me boundaries, not fences. Mm -hmm. And I think that really ultimately helped me go into, I always wanted psychology or psychiatry, but I didn't want to go back to school. They offered it. No, I'm not interested. I always wanted to understand all odd behavior, including my own, obviously. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, why am I doing this? Why do I know this? And how do I control it? It's the control, I think, for everybody that scares people about it just comes to me and I'm terrified, they tell me. They have horrible tuning in. And I am so grateful that I loved psychology from the time I'm 10. It really helped synthesize it. But I left him. I almost died after I gave birth. They told me I'd be dead in eight hours. And I knew they didn't know me. <laughs> so you started working with the police. How long ago was that? That was in 1979. I moved to New uh, New York, uh, New Jersey from New York, and uh, somebody wrote an article in a local newspaper on uh, psychic communicates with animals, because I had I don't know rescued an animal, whatever, don't even know, and apparently the police read it, and I went to my son's karate class I had just signed him up for, and I didn't know the karate instructor was a police officer no clue and she took me aside at the end and she said there's a rape murder in town and immediately flashed in my mind an image now when we say flash in your mind i want the polymath guy to think about that where's it come from how do i know that right maybe i'm picking up from her she asked for her case i don't know maybe the, because i think wireless is first us we're all wireless we're all connected somehow, and I have other examples, not mine, but bacteria and all, how they all learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So I, maybe we do. So I just gave her a description and she said, oh, okay. And the next week she said, would you mind speaking to my boss? So he was there and I tell him again, he said, would you mind talking to me and my partner tomorrow? I said, okay. So they came to my office, half a mile from the police station. They're sitting in my office in my home. And uh, we're about eight feet from each other. I'm sitting on a chair. There are two of them on the couch. And he said, so would you tell my partner? I, I described the guy again. And they look at each other. And they go, we got a problem with that. And I said, why? And they said, well, there are two men answering that description. At which point, no thought whatsoever. I stood up. I marched across the room with a decided limp and then sat back down. And they looked at me and they said, how did you know somebody, one of those, had a limp? I said, it's easy. I just became him. And in my head, I'm going, you are truly nuts, Nancy. Mm -hmm. I was sure. right. He went back. They fully confessed. They told him the same thing that, that dete Detective Ross English became the chief of detectives. And we worked 10 years together. And he said to the guy, not the first, this is the first one, I think. Yeah. He said, we have an eyewitness who saw you do it. So when he told me that, I said, Ross, I wasn't there. He said, yes, but your eye did. <laughs> <laughs> and they got the full confession. And that was the first confession of many there. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of, some of the other cases that uh, you've worked on. You there's um, Tell us the ones that kind of stand out in, in your mind. Let's go. Oh, how many details do you want? I'm I'm all into details. I'm neurotically. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm okay. I'm, neurot I'm, I'm neurotically into details. Uh, in a, in a previous life, before I started doing this, I used to be a, a periodontal regenerative surgeon. So my, oh, my so my, really? my 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 life was in millimeters. So I'm oh, into details. That's very funny because. I always, I just spoke to somebody yesterday in the field and I remembered, uh, I gave a talk at West Point for the Board of New York Dentistry because one of my students was the head of it. And when he said, I want you to give a talk, I said, what are you crazy? He said, no, no, give the talk. So I made it a workshop for all of them. 
And I had business cards of different people I knew in envelopes they could not read. And they were so accurate. And they said, how is that possible? I said, because your whole life is about the detailless details. And I am a nitpicker. And maybe that's why I'm good. Mm -hmm. So I find that the whole dental, truthfully, the dental world and anyone who does the microcosm of anything, wow. Right? It, it, you just get it. So here is the ongoing saga, I'm going to call it. It's in my book, and not all of it is finished. Because even after we put it in the book, it's coming out pre-order September 30th. Um, it, and there'll be a link in the notes. In the show notes already. Thank you. It's all still happening in certain levels. So I have to be... All right. So I get called about a year after an unidentified, probably teenager sort of body was found clothed uh, and they didn't tell me. And it was a task force. And so I met some of the greatest people I had met in the field. The first who wrote all the information for the bill for the missing and exploited children. Uh, it, this was Blairstown, New Jersey, I think. And the body was titled Princess Doe because they felt terrible about it. The only evidence they had that she had anything on her was a little uh, cross on a necklace. Only they had no pictures of her face. They had not, you know, nothing at the time. And they had nothing. I think it was about a year into it. And so I went with them uh, on a drive. And I'm pretty good. I'm terrible at navigating normally in a car. Thank God for GPS. Mm -hmm. However, when I am asked to look for terrible things, I can find them. It's weird. For me, it's totally bizarre because they go, go that road, pull up over here by the supermarket next to the pizza parlor. They said, oh, you're hungry. I said, no, they were here. So I go in and I could see a guy and I see the girl sort of, I don't know how old she is. She looks kind of young, maybe 15, 16. I don't know, 14. And I, I know she's been there and she may have been elsewhere. So I come back out and I go, we got to go about half a mile and go to the right. Well, that's where the cemetery is where they found her. So they pull the car in and we walk and I go, I'll, you follow me. I'll show you where I feel she was. And I go right over to the ravine and they go, yes, that's where the caretaker found her body. So now we go back to the uh, uh, prosecutor's office and we sit there. It's a, it's a county with not a lot of um, staff. And I'm holding the cross by myself. I tell them I need to be alone and I'm seeing a man. And she says, she knows his name is John and the last name begins with an R and it's a one syllable, I can't make it out. So I start chatting with her as if she's real and sitting next to me. And she's telling me um, she ran away, maybe, maybe. She's not identifying it as that. And I get this image of the guy all of a sudden. And he's got reddish hair, he's got a scar on his right cheek and he wears a Western belt buckle. And those were the identifying features I could get. So I tell them, there's another guy also, but I can't make him out at all because I don't know how long he's been with him. But I do know he, John took a hammer to her and crushed her head. God, okay. End of story. Nothing happened. Five years later, nothing's happened. Princess Doe is now well known throughout the nation. And five years later, the same Captain David here uh, called me. Oh, I mean, he didn't call. I get a client in my office. I look at her and I go, you just had a terrible tragedy in your life. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, it's a family member and she's dead. And she said, yes, my sister was murdered. I said, they think it's her boyfriend, but it isn't. She said, would you mind speaking to the police? It just happened like the day before, I think. And I said, no, no. you can just give them Detective Ross English's name. He will confirm I work on this. She said, okay. And so David Heater calls me. He's the guy I also worked closely with on the first one, mainly. And he says, uh, when I heard it was you, it's okay. 
would you mind coming out? And I said, no, not at all. Fresh crime scene. Lovely. So I go and I stand in a doorway. It's a two-story apartment. She's on the first floor. And I remember standing there and looking upstairs and said, the murderer is upstairs. His name is John. Last name begins, I don't know, a single syllable. Um, he's the killer. And they're just looking, they're not saying a word. It's either confirm, deny, or nothing, right? And I don't want them to say. I always tell them, wait, don't say anything. Don't give me anything. It will just mess my mind up. I'll get confused. So I walk in to the living room and I go over to the vacuum because I feel something's really off with it. And I touch it. And they look at me and I go, the cord, the cord that was part of the murder. And the next is her bedroom. And I go in the bed is all that. I have to be careful how I say it because I am still very close to the family 40 years later. Mm -hmm. And so I see everything there and I have this image of her and I know how she was killed and I explain it and I go hammer to the head and I know how she was tied up with the cord. I explain that. We go back to the um, prosecutor's office. And I tell them his name is John. He lives upstairs. I know that. And he's got a Western belt buckle on his belt. And he's got a scar on the right cheek. And David's looking at me and going, do you remember saying this five years ago? I said, no, no, I've worked on a lot of things since then. But if I did, then he's a serial killer. What can I tell you? So. They said, well, it's impossible. We polygraphed him. I said, I don't care what you tell me. He's the killer. They said, no, no, we polygraphed him. She died about 11. I said, no, she didn't. She died much later. How do I know any of this? I have no clue. I'm just in it, in the moment. Mm -hmm. right? sure. And so they said, oh, well, I said, look, David and his partner, don't remember his name. I said, David, you got to go back and take a look at him. I swear to you. So David said, well, there's a 19-year-old with his mom and then her boyfriend. I said, it's the boyfriend. He's not 19. Go back and look at him. Scar on the right cheek. But I remember being so frustrated. And I'm thinking later, why are you doing all this? You don't even know if you're right. You're nuts. You know never to insist when you're working with clients, ever because you can't guarantee anything. But I felt so strongly about this man killing, I didn't want him killing again. So they went back based on what I said, and he confessed. Wow. And then the polygraph expert, Jerry Lewis was his name, said, and he wrote a letter to me, I have it on my website somewhere probably. And he said, in my 23 years, I have never been wrong except for this one case. Mm -hmm. Glad you caught it. And then the autopsy, you know, they didn't do autopsy right away. So when the autopsy came, yeah, she did die later. And they had not, they had not questioned him past 1130. Oh, okay. So, but now we go to today. John Reese died. She has been identified for Cesto just about a month or two ago. And in the identification, a man who has been put away and his wife who live in New York, who's never killed outside of New York and maybe Pennsylvania, claims he killed her. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yeah. Right. We don't know. So I made a list of all the discrepancies in the case completely of the current one mm -hmm. of, of the Princess Doe that came to light. Of all the discrepancies and in doing so, I also got an email from someone who I'm not allowed to mention because I promised her uh, that she was seven years old when John Reese had that girl tied up upstairs in their home and that he had, and we know he attempted to kill his own wife mm -hmm. in front of the little girl who was telling me this and she knew who the girl was upstairs. And so things like this don't make sense. I can't make any sense of it other than two of them killed her. When I was working on uh, the murder of Elizabeth Cornish in Long Valley, I think it was, or Belvedere, can't remember where she lived. And with David Heater, the second one, 
I had told them the hammer was in the swamp nearby. I didn't know there was a swamp. I didn't know there was a hammer until I said that. And then they found the hammer, but the DNA did not match the DNA for Elizabeth. Only I don't think they ever tested it for Princess Doe. Okay. And that's one of the discrepancies. Did they throw it out? Did they? I don't know. So there are a bunch of things that add up but don't add up and add up to two killers, maybe, or maybe not. But then if not, how did I know John Reese five years before and right. get it from the murder victim? Maybe. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you for joining Dr. Orrest and his incredible guest. Like what you heard and learned? Then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it. Three, leave a review and rate this podcast. Opt in at www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and get our free digital magazine with savings, articles, and deeper dives into cool controversy. Be the guy who takes action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want. Thank you again and make it a great day.